Testing, testing. Alright, we're gonna do this. Welcome back to Cosmic Comics. Today I take a look at the Roy Thomas era of Adam Warlock, which will also continue the High Evolutionary. This era is spread across a four-issue story arc beginning in Marvel Premiere Volume 1, Issues number 1 and 2, written by Roy Thomas, with Mike Friedrich receiving a co-author credit on issue number 2. Warlock then gets his own title and Roy Thomas concludes his era of Adam Warlock's story with issue number 2. All four issues were published in 1972. Marvel Premiere number 1's opening splash tells us who this story is going to be about. Him. The last time we saw Adam Warlock mentioned, he was still him. This is the story in which him becomes Warlock by becoming involved with the High Evolutionary. The last time we saw the High Evolutionary, he had evolved into the Ultimate and merged with the Eternal Cosmos where he could see all of eternity. Feel free to check it out at the link above. The issue begins with a spaceship disguised as an asteroid entering our solar system and settling into an orbit around Earth. Inside the asteroid, we find the High Evolutionary who is making a record of his progress. The story of Project Alpha. After months of travel, he thinks it is fitting to record the story here in the presence of his home world. The High Evolutionary says, I'll do this day what no man born of woman has ever dreamed of doing or lose my soul trying. This is foreshadowing as him has previously said, that he was not born of man and woman. I was created to be invincible, and those who made me made me well. The reason the High Evolutionary is recording the story of Project Alpha is with the hope that others will learn from his mistakes. Some of what he wants to share will be painful. The worst of those sins was the new form of life he created. Something part animal and part human, he named his creation new men. When we flash back to the moment, Roy Thomas takes the liberty to change some of the wording. Not sure why, because it appears from the art as though somebody had the original there as a reference. It's just that I don't see any reason for the switch in wording. Anyway, one of the new men was left in the evolutionary chamber for too long, and thus the man-beast was born. He then created the evil new men, but was defeated by Thor. Man-beast and his evil new men were exiled to the Dromasana galaxy. The high evolutionary took his remaining new men and left Earth. He didn't leave because he had to, but to protect mankind from any eventual threat from the new men. In an untold story, Thor helps the High Evolutionary find a new home planet to settle down on. Once the Evolutionary settles in, things don't work out for the best as his new men slowly regress, growing more savage and bestial over time. These events were covered in my second video on the High Evolutionary. This ends with the High Evolutionary performing his first human experiment. He's become his own test subject, speeding up his own evolution, culminating in him evolving into the Ultimate, who then leaves to become one with the Eternal Cosmos. Unfortunately for the High Evolutionary, within him remained a sliver of humanity, and this is what ends his Nirvana. Over time, he became lonely. Loneliness which drove him to the brink of madness. Eventually, he decided to return to his metal costume in order to do something new. The first new new man we get to see in this issue, following the high evolutionary undoing all of his previous evolutionary experiments, is Sir Ram. Now with one more A than the previous Sir Ram, so as not to confuse anybody. The High Evolutionary is upset at being interrupted, but then concedes due to Sir Ram's previous history, he should give him the benefit of the doubt while simultaneously reminding Sir Ram that he once saved his life. Upon arriving at Lock 10, Sir Ram brings the now recognizable cocoon of him before the High Evolutionary. Their cameras zoom in on the cocoon for a better look, but 
The High Evolutionary is still at a loss as to what they have run across and commands that it be brought into the lock. Upon bringing the object inside, the High Evolutionary remarks that it appears to be a cocoon or a coffin. He instructs Sir Ram to guide the ship to a position on the far side of the sun while he investigates the cocoon. For a moment, the High Evolutionary stops and reflects on the Numen lackeys of his past. Tagar and Porja, lamenting that all of them are gone and only Sir Ram remains. But he doesn't get lost in thought for long, snapping out of it and focusing on the task at hand. This is a nice nod to Stan Lee's creation, the two original Newmen. The High Evolutionary's psych probes are in place and he senses breathing beneath the cocoon's surface. We are given some light foreshadowing when the High Evolutionary notes that he cannot pass by one mystery while en route to another. An image is projected onto his megaviz, and I think the High Evolutionary might be a little bit smitten, or perhaps him is putting forth the same blinding light we saw him exuding during his first appearance. The High Evolutionary proclaims that the image he has on screen would blind a mortal. He goes on to call him the dream of human perfection. He's discovered the ultimate, ultra-human new man that the High Evolutionary always wanted to create. From the first time he sees him, the High Evolutionary thinks of him as the son he would have created. Him can hear the High Evolutionary and interjects that he is no man's son or woman's. I am only what I am. The High Evolutionary is surprised that the creature responds telepathically within his ear. And of course the High Evolutionary wants to know who or what he is speaking to. The response? I have never been called anything but him. Intrigued, the High Evolutionary wants to know more. Him senses both power and nobility within the High Evolutionary, and since Him was created to strive towards nobility, Him is going to share his origins and rebirth, and why that has led him to seek instead unbirth and oblivion. I have already covered what takes place over these next two pages in my video looking at Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's time with him. The story ends with him regressing back into his cocoon and being hurled into outer space. Metamorphosed in what he calls the Void, he requests that he be returned to the Void as it is not yet time for his emergence. The High Evolutionary agrees to this request, especially since it shouldn't interfere with Project Alpha, which he totally name-dropped, hoping that him would ask about it, and sure enough, him wants to know more. You have to love the way the High Evolutionary talks around him. It's like he's getting excited that he might have run across somebody he considers a true peer. I also get the feeling that he's loosening up a bit or maybe trying to play it cool in front of him. It's obvious he sees them as equals when he says things such as, I have no wish to thwart one who may be as immortal as myself, or unlike yourself, I was once human, then became like unto a god. But here's the kicker, the High Evolutionary came back to his body because he's lonely. He's decided what good is it to be a god without a world to act as his shrine, and here comes the insane plan. Sir Ram took a smaller than a basketball size of once molten rock from Earth, and from this the High Evolutionary is going to build a new Earth in a mirror image of the old. Him wants to know why the man-god wants to build a new earth. After all, from what he's seen of humans, they're mean, base, and miserable creatures. The High Evolutionary admits that there is truth in what him says, and here it is, the sliver of doubt. In his bleaker moments, the High Evolutionary has considered that he's taken off in pursuit of a madman's dream. But 
then the High Evolutionary snaps out of it and he gets his crazy train right back on track in creating a new Earth. He's going to shape it to be different. One fateful difference. He's got him totally hooked now. Time to finish the sales pitch. The High Evolutionary shows him an image of Earth and insists that man should have evolved into a godlike race such as himself. He fails to share the fact that he achieved this by using a machine, a process the High Evolutionary could have easily replicated for all humans, but this may be the reason he doesn't want to move forward with that plan. He tells us there is evil abroad in that world, an instinct of human aggression which leads to abuse of office by those in power and mindless destructive revolt by those denied power. It is a world which fights one war in order to end all wars, then fights another, and still another, a world far better at counting bodies than counting cost. Looking at such scenes and thinking about man's failures brings a pall over the High Evolutionary and makes him worry that he has set forth on an impossible task for himself. Him is getting tired of waiting. He wants the High Evolutionary to give him an answer. He will make the new Earth more perfect than the old by denying the humans the instinct of gross aggression, which the High Evolutionary sees as a defining difference between the old Earth being the hell that it is versus the heaven it could be. The chunk of dried up magma Sir Ram brought back is similar to a cell from the body, and in it, it contains all the information he needs to create his counter earth. I, I know this is going to work out because this is comics and it's a fun idea, but th that's not how things work. But we're going to run with it. This. This is what we got. The plan is to set up a counter Earth on the exact opposite side of Earth's orbit around the sun and then use the sun to remain hidden from Earth. Yeah. After sending his rock out into outer space, the High Evolutionary bombards the pedal with unnamed rays which somehow increase its mass and thus its gravity. This is then supposed to start attracting swarms of asteroids, but this doesn't make sense as the Earth would have already pulled in this material when it passed through the area, but I guess he's got technology or something. It's a comic and Roy Thomas is doing what he's got to do to set up this story. The High Evolutionary states that meteorites float through space, but that's wrong. Uh, meteorite is a meteor that has passed through the Earth's atmosphere and then struck the ground. Just getting that out of the way for anyone who was... Never mind. As the plan goes into motion, Him attempts to talk the High Evolutionary out of it, noting that it is nothing more than folly and the entire affair is stressing him out too much. But the High Evolutionary isn't going to turn back now. He started enjoying himself, enjoying the act of creation, birthing a new world. As the seas run red with lava, he points out a rising mass that will someday form into his counter-Earth's moon. After the fire comes flood, rain, rain to cool the surface and bring forth life. And this isn't the old life, no, this is new life. For seven hours he tolls away, as he continues to create the High Evolutionary begins to sweat under the strain, but he uses the power of his immortal brain to guide his counter-Earth through millions of years of evolution. We see an age of oceans as he pushes forward millions and then billions of years. Beasts rise forth and walk in the land, and the diversity within the Tree of Life continues to grow and blossom. But the High Evolutionary is waiting for a singular moment. He's waiting for the rise of man. I'm I'm not gonna deep dive on it, um, but just will point out that uh, this is not how any evolution works. Uh, 
So this whole time, the High Evolutionary doesn't know this, but he is being watched. Not by him, but by another. One who calls the High Evolutionary a prophet. But this creature doesn't want the prophet to be the hand that molds the proverbial clay. Instead of the High Evolutionary, Man Beast wants to mold the New World in his image. The High Evolutionary is so deep into his work that he's completely unaware of the Man Beast plot or that he's being monitored. While Man Beast plots, the High Evolutionary coaxes an ape like creature down to the ground and guides it into walking upright. The High Evolutionary becomes hyper focused as he zeroes in on the last few thousand years. Now, the only thing left to do is to purge the first man, the new Adam of his killer instinct. To perform this act will take the High Evolutionary's full concentration. As he closes in on his goal, the strain of the day becomes too much. The High Evolutionary gives in to exhaustion and falls asleep before the job is done. He's seemingly done so at a horrible moment for the future of his new world. With the tapestry almost complete, Man Beast points out that any passing predator could come along and finish the job. Man Beast begins taking over the technology of the asteroid and doing just that. On board the ship, Sir Ram is alarmed by the sounds of scuffling coming from the space lock. Upon calling out to see who is there, he's shocked by what he sees. Man Beast feigns that he's disappointed that he isn't met with forgiveness. He then shoots Sir Ram, killing him. As Man Beast and his crew come on board, he instructs them to respect the dead. Man Beast enters the High Evolutionary's chambers while Him's head still floats on the Megaviz. As he passes by the High Evolutionary, the Man Beast makes it clear that he did arrive at his original destination of the Dromasana Galaxy, where he has been waiting. While there, the Man Beast has grown stronger, and now he's ready for revenge. The Man Beast refers to the High Evolutionary as his father. He's not here to destroy his father. No, he's here to destroy his father's creation. With Man Beast at the controls, he makes a subtle change to counter Earth's history, leading man towards violence against his fellow man in a moment reminiscent of Cain and Abel. But Man Beast doesn't stop there. He pushes forward through the ages until Counter Earth commits what he calls the ultimate transgression. This is all weird from a theological perspective because this means on the Counter Earth that Man Beast birthed and killed Christ, or at least a Christ like figure on New Earth when he was at the controls. And that raises all sorts of crazy theological questions that we're not going to get into right here. The path Man Beast has chosen for mankind leads to more war in a world where heroes slay instead of save. <laughs> Whatever that means, but that's a it's a cool quote. We're shown a world that is harder, crueler than our own, a world of slaughter baptized beneath the sword. More uh, religious language and imagery creeping in there. This new world is one in which men continue to perfect ways to inflict pain and terror upon one another. This leads to religion being burned away. The humans of this world see no need for it, as their world is beyond redemption. As Man Beast finishes up, he remarks that this world has no shining knight to save it. Basically, it doesn't take much reading between the lines to see what he means is that this world is lacking a Jesus figure but we we just saw that other stuff a few panels ago and but anyways without religion without some kind of Jesus figure the world is doomed a voice breaks in telling the man beast he's done enough man beast is sent 
flying across the room. The high evolutionary has shaken himself from his slumber. He rises forth, cursing the day he birthed man-beast. A stunned man-beast is taken aback by the high evolutionary's newfound strength. Daddy holds his head up high and tells Man-Beast what's up. The High Evolutionary has been reborn. If Man-Beast is a hybrid of superior man and superior beast, well, the High Evolutionary is beyond all that. He's the, um, he's still the High Evolutionary, but he is supreme. The Man-Beast then calls forth his evil new men. It's Interesting to note that all of the High Evolutionary's new men devolved into savage, uncontrollable creatures over time, to the extent that by this point, all of them have perished. That doesn't appear to be the case with the evil new men, which could indicate that the evil new men are the more stable of the two creations. The evil Newman attempt to shoot the High Evolutionary for attacking the Man-Beast, but he's not having it. Using his eyes to somehow blast and incapacitate the evil Newman. But the High Evolutionary isn't the only one capable of such shenanigans. The Man-Beast uses his mind blast to cripple the High Evolutionary. As the battle rages, him watches the battle from the Megaviz. On more than one occasion, the High Evolutionary is referred to as Living Armor. It is possible that he never regained a body of flesh and blood following his re-emergence from the Eternal Cosmos. Him begins to look worried as not just the Man-Beast, but his horde of evil Newmen all descend upon the High Evolutionary. Him sees the earth below, ravaged by the man-beast's changes, and him makes a decision, and thus, the cocoon begins to open. Two things are interesting about this. First, if disturbed, him can choose to come out of the cocoon seemingly at will. And secondly, once again, him is having to emerge before completing his incubation process. A decision has been made, and him is free once more. He bursts forth with a new costume and a little bit of bling. As he bursts forth, he calls for Man Beast to step away from the High Evolutionary. The narrator lets us know that there are so many creatures mobbing the High Evolutionary that Him's voice is barely heard over the snarling. When the creatures fail to respond, Him leaps into the fray. As he leaps forth, the evil new men and man beast all disappear. Him assumes that since their foes are gone, that they have won the battle. The High Evolutionary lets him know how juvenile such thinking can be. Before he left, the Man-Beast taunted the High Evolutionary with a plan of conquest for the planet below. He then took his evil new men and went to the planet. The High Evolutionary is upset that his creation, his counter-Earth, which was meant to be a better Earth, is now forever flawed. His dream is corrupted before it ever had time to mature. The High Evolutionary is left with but one choice. Like a mistake on a blackboard, he's just going to reach out his hand and erase his creation, turning it into cosmic dust. Him reaches out, telling the High Evolutionary to stop. Him insists that this planet deserves better. The High Evolutionary calls him out, pointing out that it was him who called the human species mean, base, and miserable. Him admits that he was a fool who spoke out of ignorance. By watching the fullness of human history unfold before him, him developed a new appreciation for the species. Yes, they have negative qualities, but they are also filled with pride and goodness, and that these branches of humanity should be guarded, tended, and nurtured. Him asks that instead of destroying Counter Earth, he be allowed to track down the man beast. The High Evolutionary confesses that he has no desire to destroy his creation after working on it for months. Him urges the High Evolutionary to say yes. 
while at the same time hinting once more that the high evolutionary is no longer made of flesh when him says and show that whether corporeal or not show a heart beats within that armored breast the panel ends with the high evolutionary foreshadowing him's eventual doom even though he went on and on about him's perfection at the beginning of the issue, he believes that the man beast powers are far beyond him's. The high evolutionary then implies he has something that might even the odds. Him makes it clear that he wishes to pursue the task. The high evolutionary then reaches forth, placing his hand on him's arm and calls him his son, the one he never had. The machine that is the high evolutionary must have had lubrication problems or something because its right eye begins to leak some liquid as he realizes that he's sending his newfound son to his death. He's sending his son to counter Earth, to pay for the sins he created, to atone for his previous creation that is now wreaking havoc on his new creation. Him stands in place, ready to be transported to the surface below. In his parting words, the High Evolutionary warns that he probably won't have to search for the man-beast, as the man-beast will most likely be looking for him. As the machine begins to power up and him is being transported away, the High Evolutionary reflects on the boon, the offer of help he made to him to defeat the man-beast. He takes an emerald, blazing like a great green star, and places it upon him's brow. This is the Soul Gem, and the first appearance of any Infinity Stone in the pages of Marvel Comics. Endgame and the Infinity Gauntlet both have their origins here. As him is sent to the surface of Counter-Earth, the High Evolutionary contends that him needs to be ready for pain in other senses he has never known. The pain him is feeling is a fraction of the pain it feels to be a man. As he continues sinking from the heavens to Earth, he's told he'll be a target on Earth and due to his uncanny sacred mission and his unearthly weirdling powers, which I don't know why the High Evolutionary calls him unearthly as him was made on the earth but anyway because of his sacred mission and weirdling powers upon beholding them men shall call him warlock and we close with what appears to be some young adults or teens witnessing warlock's landing the next issue is given three different titles at the close of issue one it's the hounds of hell on the cover of issue 2, it's Rodan and the Hounds of Helios, and inside the front cover, it's the Hounds of Helios. The issue begins with the young adults from the previous issue rushing in to check on Warlock, whom they saw drop in from outer space. The side bubble lets us know David Carter is leading the charge. As the youths approach, Warlock is still smoking from his entry through the atmosphere. One of the kids is surprised to see a man with gold skin, but as another kid puts it, skin is skin. David reaches down to touch the spaceman and discovers that he's still too hot to touch. The observant youth remarks that anybody that hot should have had all of their skin burn off. The kids assume the man is dead after the fall he took, but then he begins to move. Jace thinks Warlock is there as part of a scam, but David points out that in his current condition, this guy couldn't put one over on anybody. David asks who he is and if he's okay. Warlock, with the soul stone still centered on his forehead, says he doesn't know. Classic comic book amnesia. The kids, being kids, do the right thing and decide to help the stranger out. They help lift him off the ground and begin to carry him inside a nearby barn where they let him collapse onto some hay. Once Warlock passes out, the kids wait. David suggests they could pray, 
This brings in religious themes again, but weren't we told a short while ago that religion wasn't a thing in this new world? Warlock wakes up, looking somewhat afraid. The kids introduce themselves, David, Jace, whose full name is Jason, and the twins, Eddie and Ellie. Jace wants to know what Warlock's name is, but he responds that he doesn't have one. But he remembers not long ago, he was told that men would call him Warlock. Ellie likes his name, but insists that it sounds like a last name. She wants to know his first name. Warlock remembers that most humans use a name and a surname. David wants to know where Warlock came from, and again, Warlock comes up short, insisting that he doesn't know where he came from or who he is. Ellie then christens Warlock as Adam for being one of a kind. And just like that, in two issues, Roy Thomas has taken him and transformed him into Adam Warlock. Jace shows he's fed up by pointing out that Adam is paying more attention to the cat than he is to them. He suspects that Adam might not be all there. This suggestion almost leads to a fight between David and Jace, but both cool off pretty quick when Adam calls for them both to stop. As Adam adapts to his new life, he has forgotten about the High Evolutionary orbiting high above. We're shown that the High Evolutionary is aware of Adam's memory loss, and he's afraid of what that might mean for their mission. A full page is taken to recap the previous issue. We learn nothing new from the recap, but on the following page, we are told that when the Man-Beast took over the reins of creation, he ensured that no superheroes or supervillains exist on Counter-Earth. Reed Richards, Victor Von Doom, and Bruce Banner all remain their regular scientist selves. It's odd that Counter-Earth mimics out Earth to the extent that we have people being born with the exact same names and presumably similar if not the exact same DNA. I don't know how any of this is supposed to work, it doesn't make sense, and again we just have to roll with it. After the High Evolutionary finishes recounting the story of Project Alpha, we switch back over to Man-Beast who is calling for one of his evil new men, Cobra. Counter-Earth gets more and more bizarre as we learn that Warlock has been located in Southern California. So New Earth has the same people and geography of that is the old Earth. Man-Beast wants to know who has been tasked with killing Warlock. He's super happy with Cobra's choice of assassin, Rodan, Master of the Hounds of Helios. Rodan appears super confident as he heads out to complete his task, proclaiming he will return with Warlock's head or some other identifiable part of his body. Cobra hisses out a salty insult as Rodan leaves, calling him a lackey. This visibly upsets Rodan. He then leaves in a chariot pulled by the Hounds of Helios. We then shift gears as we are introduced to a bunch of guys traveling in a Rolls Royce with broken air conditioning. In the front passenger seat is Marlo, a private eye, who has located four runaway kids for the three gentlemen in the back seat. Marlo is enjoying his present position. Important people powerful people are in need of the information he has, and as such, Marlo is calling the shots. He gives the trio a quick introduction. Colonel Barney Roberts, who has the same last name as the twins Eddie and Ellie. He was the commanding officer of some H-bomb test. Next is David's father, Senator Nathan Carter, who is firmly in the pocket of the defense industry. The third is Jason's dad, Mr. Josiah Gray, and he gets an odd description. The guy who gives black capitalism a bad name. What does that even mean? Following the introductions, Marlo pulls up to the four missing teens who recognize it must be their fathers. As the dads and Marlo get out of the vehicle, we briefly get a shot of a well-dressed driver. 
The two generations face off. The senator tells David that they aren't here to drag the youth away, kicking and screaming back to the world that they rejected. Instead, he wants to ask why. But David doesn't have any answers for his father, insisting that if he has to ask the question, then he's never going to know the answer. Which is kind of rude. Your dad obviously cares about you. He drove all this way just to get your perspective on things. In return, David gives him the cold shoulder. Colonel Robert reaches out to his twins. Eddie insists that it's nothing they haven't discussed before, and there must be some truth to this because Colonel Roberts knows exactly what his son is talking about. The twins are opposed to his career choice. He wishes he could get his kids to see that the military can be used for both good and evil, but both parties already know where the other stands. Jason insists that they aren't interested in money and power. Again, a sincere father reaches out, attempting to understand his son's perspective, hoping to convince his son that he and the other two dads aren't bad guys. A third party speaks up, calling Josiah Gray out by name. Josiah turns around, confused, as he should be, a golden man just walked out of a barn. And it definitely doesn't go without notice. Josiah accuses Adam of stealing their children, but Adam corrects him. He didn't steal these children. The three men gave them away. The colonel has had enough. He wants to know who this joker really is. Adam keeps the quick retorts coming, telling the men that they should have asked themselves as many questions as they are asking him if they didn't want their kids to seek refuge in the wilderness. Both the colonel and Josiah look taken aback in this panel. The senator appears more calm, but that's because he has a plan. He calls for the private eye to pull his gun. As Marlowe motions for Adam to move aside, one of the hounds of Helios arrives on the scene, diving in from behind. Marlowe might have perished had instinct not brought Adam Warlock charging forward. Adam follows this up with a crack to the hound's jaws before pinning the beast on its back. Still, the two struggle. Adam continues putting pressure on the hound's neck until... Snap! Adam, who was sent here to overcome the evil of the world, is killed. He rises from the beast's dead form, his body sick with revulsion, but in that moment of self-loathing, Warlock finds clarity. For the first time, he knows who and what he is. As this revelation comes over him, the Soul Stone begins to react. Adam Warlock then takes to the skies. This world has no superheroes, so everybody is amazed. Having witnessed this, the dads no longer appear to be angry, but the colonel is still asking for answers on who this guy is and where he came from. Adam, he doesn't just fly into the sky, he soars up and engages Rodan in combat. Rodan, sure of himself, wants to know if his opponent has come to surrender. But the hound at the front of the chariot isn't making any such concessions. The beast knows a natural enemy when it sees one. Rodan calls in his hound to kill Adam, to show him the meaning of solar power. The soul gem continues to react, while the narration tells us knowledge is true power, and I guess somehow that knowledge is transformed into physical force? because a beam burst forth from the gym, striking the hound and hitting in such a manner that it reverts it back to its true form. A series of random solar impulses at the same time, Rodin is sent tumbling towards the earth, but his anti-grav belt will stop him from taking too hard of a fall. Rodan lands and Warlock pursues him into the barn. We're given a long, drawn out squee, and then Warlock emerges, looking to the side. Warlock, the bringer of peace, just let loose so much destruction. The kind of power and destruction the kids just got done professing to have no interest in. We switch back over to the families who are shocked by what they have witnessed, and for the third or fourth time this issue, we have to go through the circle of, he didn't have a name until Ellie gave him one. 
we get one more religious reference with Jace referring to himself as a doubting Thomas, giving credibility to the fact that as seen earlier, there was some kind of Jesus Christ figure that did die on a cross. Adam is ready to take the children away from their fathers. David wants to ensure Adam won't hurt their fathers. David insists that their dads, they aren't bad men, but Adam and the fathers aren't ready to back down. These are powerful men. Adam insists that he knows better than them and offers to show them all he does know if they'll look into his eyes. Each of the three men look. Adam shares visions of pain and suffering brought forth from the choices made by men such as themselves, a world of suffering which was created in which so few of the men behind those decisions, well, so few of them were really bad men. These men know that what Adam has showed them is truth, and each turns away in silence. The men just get into the Rolls Royce and are driven away. The kids have questions for Warlock, such as what did the men see in his eyes? Ellie wants to know if it was the positive vision of the world the rest of them saw. A world without evil hiding behind good intentions. Surprisingly, Warlock lies to her and tells Ellie what she wants to hear instead of the truth. Warlock cuts off more questions by telling the kids that there are things that need doing. David is super excited for Warlock to give them some direction. As they walk away, Ellie has more questions. She wants to know if Adam killed Rodan. No, he didn't. Instead, he reverted him back to what he once was, reverting Rodan back to a rat. That seems like an awesome power to have when facing off against evil new men. As we see Rodan's fate in the final panel, he has been killed by a barn cat. The vibe at the end of this issue sits somewhere between Jesus and his disciples and Charles Manson. After this issue, Adam Warlock gets his own title in Warlock No. 1, published in 1972, although to me, the title always looked like it reads The Power of Warlock. The issue is written by Roy Thomas, with pencils by Gil Kane and inks by Tom Sutton. The opening splash shows us the High Evolutionary continuing to record these events into his journal. Today's entry is titled, The Day of the Prophet. Time is of the essence as the High Evolutionary works towards averting a cosmic catastrophe. Three days ago on Earth, the real Earth, not counter-Earth, events were set into motion when the United States launched an unmanned rocket bound towards the far side of the sun. The High Evolutionary is worried about what will happen as soon as the ship's cameras come around the sun and see his counter-Earth. The High Evolutionary looks upon his creation, admitting that he failed to allow for the possibility of the phenomenon of culture shock brought on by the two Earths learning of one another's existence. When the High Evolutionary considers the possibility of having both worlds destroyed from the shock of the two Earths, he thinks it might be safest to destroy Counter-Earth. The only thing stopping him from doing so is his promise to Adam Warlock. If he breaks his promise to Warlock, then the High Evolutionary is, well, he's no better than those he created. The hypocrisy is funny because any flaws are due to the shortcoming of the creator just my opinion. His choice comes down to one of two levers. With the first lever pulled, both Earths will become invisible to each other, while the second lever will disintegrate counter-Earth. He wants to pull the second lever, but his promise to Adam Warlock forces him to pull the first. The High Evolutionary's word is his bond. After a quick, shimmering burst, the task is complete. Counter-Earth has been placed out of sync with the real Earth, thus making each invisible to the other. This is not unlike what happened to many of the Avengers during the Thanos War. But the High Evolutionary solution is less than ideal, as eventually one Earth will discover the other. The possibility gives the High Evolutionary a bit of a panic attack, and he decides he needs to speak with Warlock. Adam, while walking with his teen disciples, 
Here's the sculptor of worlds. This earth's literal creator calls down from the heavens and begins speaking to Adam Warlock. And Adam is the only one who can hear the voice calling out to him. As Adam responds, David wants to know who Warlock is speaking to. Jason returns to his role of doubting Thomas, calling Warlock a cook, while Jace points to a bolt coming down from above, striking Adam. David wants to help, but doesn't know what to do. Warlock's arms go out, and his senses become focused on other planes, other worlds, which are forcefully calling out to Warlock. We aren't really shown how, but we are told that Warlock answers back the only way he can as he flies up into the sky. He flies high enough that the kids can no longer see him. Once Adam has reached the edge of the heavens, he calls out to the Molder of Worlds and asks to meet him in the flesh. The High Evolutionary corrects Warlock, telling him that he is without flesh or blood, but agreeing to show his current form. And this pretty much solidifies that yes, the High Evolutionary does not have a physical body. Warlock wants to know why he was summoned. The conversation has an odd start. The High Evolutionary goes on about each of their ages, reminding Adam that he is only a few years old. And it is good to get some confirmation that Adam is several years old at this point. The High Evolutionary continues by insisting that he is more knowledgeable than Adam when it comes to worlds and worldlings. Adam concedes this point, but insists that the evolutionary did not come here to brag about himself, and if he did, then Adam would prefer to be taking care of Earth stuff. The high evolutionary isn't sure he wants to continue the experiment, believing that the threat of having counter Earth continue to exist is too high, and something I haven't brought up yet. How could the High Evolutionary be so focused on the plethora of details required to create a twin planet while never considering that one Earth might find out about the other? The High Evolutionary has summoned Adam to tell him this is the reason that he is considering destroying Counter-Earth. For the second time, Adam insists that Counter-Earth be spared. The High Evolutionary makes it clear he wasn't asking Adam for permission. He wants to know if Warlock thinks that he could stop him from destroying the planet. Warlock admits that he can't stop the destruction before calling the High Evolutionary out for turning his back on his oath. After all, Adam hasn't been given enough time to help humanity or hunt down the Man Beast. But the High Evolutionary says that that oath was given before before he had taken the time to think about the madness, corruption, and pain the man-beast is unleashing upon his once pure utopia. After all, Counter-Earth was meant to be an experiment, and now that that proverbial petri dish has been contaminated, perhaps it's best to just abort the experiment and start anew. Warlock understands what is going on here. The High Evolutionary needs Warlock to release him from his promise. In doing so, the High Evolutionary could rid himself of his two greatest mistakes in one fell swoop, the Man-Beast and Counter-Earth. Warlock insists the propensity for both good and evil on Counter-Earth was placed there by its creator, an interesting approach which ignores the Man-Beast's tan in Counter-Earth's creation. Warlock believes that good has a chance to overcome evil if the Man-Beast is removed from Counter-Earth. The High Evolutionary doubts this, but since Warlock won't release him from their pact, the High Evolutionary agrees to keep Counter-Earth until Warlock terminates the contract. A confident Adam Warlock proclaims that moment will never come. Again, the High Evolutionary doubts. Warlock is released and begins descending to the Earth. It's not a gentle landing. We're told that Warlock strikes Terra with an explosive force. This is twice now that the teens have witnessed Adam crashing to the Earth. As Adam's disciples close in, Dave is concerned because he thought Adam could fly. Adam explains he doesn't fly, he levitates, using the power of his mind, but he lost the ability from being weak and tired. 
The rest of the kids are happy to see that Adam is safe. Ellie wants to know what he saw and who he was talking to before he levitated away. For the second time, Adam answers a question from Ellie without being completely truthful. He deflects by instructing her not to ask him and then proceeds to lie outright in telling Ellie she would be incapable of understanding what is taking place. Adam stands and announces that they are at a crossroads. He wants to know which disciples are with him and which once return from whence they came. This is the moment he is asking them to join his cult. Dave, Eddie, and Ellie are all in. Although, Eddie takes a moment to point out that they aren't really sure what they're agreeing to. Jason is standing with crossed arms, indicating he may not be open to the idea. Adam notices and wants to know what's up. Jason makes some good points. Him and his friends came out to the wilderness to get away from everything going on in the city. And now Adam has shown up and he wants to pull them right back in to everything they were attempting to get away from. Secondly, they know next to nothing about Adam other than he's trying to locate a werewolf-like man-beast and they have no idea why Adam wants to find him. But Jason isn't done. He recognizes that Adam has powers, like a character from a comic book. Why is Adam wasting his powers looking for just one guy? Again, Warlock refuses to explain what is going on, insisting that he can't explain it and that anybody coming with him must do so on trust alone. This can be seen as nothing short of a test of faith. A golden man with golden hair who fell from the sky twice and can perform miracles wants his disciples to follow him without question and nothing to go on but blind faith in the knowledge that he exists. Jason knows what I'm talking about. He points out that trust can be a two-edged sword. Trust in the system is what they came out here to fight. Adam acknowledges that Jason wants to fight the greater evils of the world, and it appears that Adam wants to do the same thing, but Adam insists that he can't do so because Man-Beast is still a larger threat. Jason sticks to his guns and his ideals and tells Adam and the other teens that he's turning back. Dave reaches out and insists that Jason is going with them, while Jason tells Dave not to crowd him. Adam tells Dave to let Jason go. Adam doesn't want anybody with him who doesn't want to come. The road ahead is long and dangerous, and the decision, it belongs to Jason. With that, Adam turns away, saying, Let follow me, he who will. I must go now, with friends or without. This is Adam's ultimatum. Each teen must make a choice. Adam walks away alone to save a world that isn't his. Dave, Ellie, and Eddie are ready to chase after Adam, but Dave turns back and tells Jason that he thinks Adam needs each of them. Perhaps Jason most of all. In that moment, Jason has a change of heart. He calls for Warlock to slow his roll a little, to wait for all of them. Thus, Adam and his children walk out of the desert wilderness and back into a world and system they see as corrupt, a corruption that began when the man-beast interjected himself into the creation process. Interestingly, Roy Thomas calls Adam and his companions lost souls. These two panels carry overtones of Moses leading his people out of the desert and into the promised land. As they enter the city, for the first time, Adam walks down a city street and he takes in all the sights and sounds. People think Adam looks weird, but that's okay because all of them are equally strange to him. But should they be? After all, he watched the entirety of human history take place as Counter-Earth was formed. Before we can think about that too much, the Soul Gym clues Adam in to nearby evil. Okay, that's a new power. I wonder exactly how evil you have to be before you trigger the Soul Gym. Adam wants the kids to stay behind, but they insist they came along for the full ride. Adam doesn't argue. He acts. 
As Adam strides through the streets, we are given more religious imagery, like some avenging angel cast among mortals. Adam comes upon a man who is speaking on two of the Bible's most notoriously wicked cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. The crowd that is gathered appears more amused by than afraid of this soapbox preacher, but the preacher doesn't care about the crowd or what they think of him. He's got a religious mission. He is a prophet paving the way for another. And when this mysterious other comes, he, he will help you. A young man points out that the prophet makes big promises, but is short on the details about how they are going to be helped out. His girlfriend attempts to get him to stop, insisting that the guy is just another crazy street preacher. And then the prophet starts acting like a crazy street preacher, doing the whole, oh yes, there are those who think I'm mad shtick, but that's what people want you to think, and if they succeed, then the world is doomed. As Adam and his disciples watch, a woman approaches. She asks Adam to save her brother, the prophet. Adam turns to her and says it is too soon before asking if she knows who he is. Oddly, and without explanation, she goes into full shock and awe mode. She doesn't know his name, but knows that he's both a good and mighty man. Her brother, the prophet, is in danger and needs protection. Adam, uh, still trying to get caught up to speed, wants to know what danger. She points to the rooftop where a couple of dark figures lurk, waiting for sunset to strike. As the sun sets, two masked men come forth, minions of the man-beast. Both creatures leap from the rooftop, their feathered forms carrying them forth, one towards Adam and the other toward the prophet. Adam catches one in his arms, and Dave jumps in front of the other one, flying towards the prophet, all the while instructing the prophet to get moving. For his good deed, David is met with a punch which tosses him out of the bed of the truck. We learn the name of this attacker. Hawk! Adam finishes off the weaker of the two foes with a punch before returning his attention to Hawk! who is boot-stomping Jason in the chest. Adam suspects the attackers are Newman based on the beaks beneath the mask. He then punches the second of the two attackers and ends the fight for a few seconds. Adam wonders why the Prophet doesn't act to defend himself. The Prophet has a pretty good response. It is not he who seeks to prove himself, but Adam. Both attackers are back in action. The weaker of the two's name is... Pidjun, who leaps into the truck, striking Warlock from behind. The two birds work together to grab Warlock and toss him into the street, making it clear the reason they are here is as goons to pass along a message. Don't mess with the man-beast. Those fellas said the wrong thing, because mentioning the man-beast sends Warlock into action. The jewel on his head glows, and he uses its levitation ability to send himself crashing into our two foes. As Warlock starts landing blows, both enemies realize he is stronger than they have been told, and resort to sterner measures. Hawk uses his talons, a wrist-mounted laser. Adam then crashes into Pigeon, claiming that the talons can be clipped. Pigeon must also wear a talon on his wrist because it appears Warlock is destroying one in this panel. Hawk, tired of Pigeon's ineptitude, grabs David and flies into the air. David calls to be let down and Hawk agrees, lifting David over his head and tossing him into the street. Adam catches David and rolls with the blow to ensure it hurts David as little as possible. By the time he regains his footing, both birdmen have flown away. As he looks towards the skies, Adam remarks that having David unharmed is what matters most. The narrator then alludes to the fact that the four teens might be important later. Adam searches for his foes, and finding nothing, returns. The Prophet's sister is asking the Prophet why these two were after him. The Prophet insists that he's the one who should be asking questions, and wants to know who the woman is. 
This is an error. I'm almost certain that Ellie should have been drawn in this panel instead of the Prophet's sister. This would make more sense as the Prophet doesn't know Ellie and Ellie has been established as a character whose innate curiosity has her regularly asking questions. Adam steps in, explaining that these teens put their lives at risk to save the Prophet. He wants to know if the Prophet will refuse to answer the same questions for him. Adam also wants to know why the Prophet was being attacked. With wild eyes, the Prophet answers, because he was warning the world about the man-beast. Adam wants to know how the man knows what he knows. The Prophet doesn't know how he knows what he knows, only that there is a feeling of daggers in his head that won't let him rest in voices that have been sending him messages. As he explains, he begins hearing the voices once more. They tell him the one he has been waiting on is Adam Warlock. Warlock looks half ready to trust this guy, skeptically interested he wants to know if the voices tell him where the man beast is and to warlock's surprise the man says that they do warlock wants to leave right away the prophet takes a moment to warn warlock that the way is hard and filled with peril warlock is ready to go ellie wants to know what they should do adam insists that the teens seek refuge the Prophet's sister interrupts Adam and offers to let the teen stay with her. The Prophet then refers to her as his sister, adding more credibility to the wrong character being used in the earlier panel. I love that it's Jason who calls Warlock out on not being straight with them. The teens were supposed to join Warlock, but Warlock shuts Jason down with a, I shall return soon, but... Thanks for being loyal, dude. The Prophet calls for Warlock to join him, preferring to travel under the cover of night. As the two walk through the city together, Warlock wants to know what the Prophet knows about the Man-Beast. And all the Prophet knows is the Man-Beast is a threat to mankind. The Prophet makes it clear that all he's doing is following the voices in his head. This evening, the voices lead them through a series of drains and tunnels beneath the city and eventually they head up towards a dead end as they do so the voices in the prophet's head grow louder perhaps it's the voices that told him where to find the hidden switch he uses to make the wall slide up the doorway opens into a massive cavern our heroes are in awe as they walk forth and fall into a pit when a floor trap swings open beneath them. The fall is broken by cushions of fetid air. Warlock seems somewhat surprised that the Prophet was correct. They are in the lair of the Man-Beast. Warlock and the Prophet have been deposited before a giant throne surrounded by an army of evil new men. Warlock rushes forward and is attacked from all sides. We get a nice little throwback when Cobra starts giving orders to the other minions, but Warlock refuses to be stopped, tossing his enemies away from him. Warlock sees his moment and leaps forward, wondering why the man-beast appears so calm, and then he strikes, knocking a mannequin's head off. Warlock looks genuinely shocked and angry about this missed opportunity. The evil new men begin grabbing Warlock and as they do so he turns, finally realizing that the true man-beast must be the Prophet. And the Prophet pulls his own mask off like a Scooby-Doo villain revealing himself to be the man-beast. Interestingly, as this issue closes, the Man-Beast insists that he wants Warlock as an ally against the High Evolutionary and Counter Earth. Of course, he gives out his demands with a threat. As we move to the next issue, this is the beginning of the end of Roy Thomas's stint writing the character Adam Warlock. Warlock number two is plotted by Roy Thomas, but is written by Mike Friedrich. This issue is a passing of the torch from Roy's era to Mike's era of Adam Warlock.
It should be noted that Roy Thomas is Marvel's editor-in-chief during this period, and thus will continue to have input on the Warlock series and in shaping the events taking place on Counter-Earth. The top of Warlock number 2, page number 1, promises everything the reader wants right now. Warlock vs. the Man-Beast. Countdown for Counter-Earth. Man-Beast welcomes Warlock to his subterranean stronghold, while Cobra warns his master not to get too close. Warlock notes that Man-Beast no longer wears humble robes, but Man-Beast doesn't want to talk clothes. He wants to make a deal. Man-Beast would like to rule Counter-Earth with Warlock. Together. But Warlock won't hear it. To rule means to conquer, and to conquer means to destroy. But the only thing Warlock wants to destroy is Man-Beast. Cobra calls for his master to destroy Warlock, and Man-Beast remarks that his more savage wolf side would have easily done so. But Man-Beast recognizes that Warlock has the potential to be a powerful ally. Man-Beast comes off as the more civilized of the two as Warlock continues to lash out reminded of his vow to cleanse Man-Beast from the Earth. As he says this, the gym glows once more. Warlock picks up an evil Newman and hurls him across the room. As he continues to grow more violent, the evil Newman surround Warlock. Enemies dive in to dogpile on top of Adam. The gym sparkles once more, levitating Warlock upward and causing his enemies to crash in on themselves. Warlock dives in, ready to finally attack the real man-beast, but he's cut short. A ball and chain have been secured around his neck. Monk is pleased with himself, bragging that he gets paid well for such skill. Warlock then uses the evil new man's own weapon against him, swinging himself around and landing on Monk's back. While riding Monk's shoulder, the jewel flashes a third time. Warlock reaches deep into his innermost being, where he mystically grasps a fistful of the universe. He then hurls that energy into this animal man's branch of the human tree, thus reversing the evolutionary process, returning Monk to his original form, a gibbon. I'm pretty sure that this panel is a miscolored man-beast calling on Warlock to stop fighting, asking for peace. Warlock points out that it's hard to envision peace when it's man-beast goons that press the attack. In response, Man-Beast pledges to give Warlock sanctuary while Cobra begs his boss to reconsider such an offer, instead wanting Warlock dead and pointing out that the jewel is making him weak. Cobra should have known better than to question Man-Beast's authority. Cobra is backhanded for the offense. For the third time, Man-Beast requests that Warlock hear out his offer. For some reason, now that Warlock stands face to face with his goal, inches away, he agrees to hear Man-Beast out. This is annoying, as the violence of the previous four pages could and should have been completely avoided. With Warlock in agreement, Man-Beast is ready to put on a show. Man-Beast starts playing good cop. He opens with a compliment, letting Warlock know that he respects him and the force he represents. He then prepares to take Warlock away. Understandably, Warlock is hesitant, but the Man-Beast insists he will keep his word. His cape, which is wrapping around them both, is going to transport them both to the surface. Seeing this, one thinks they are going to get pulled into the cape kind of like uh, how Spawn travels around, but no, the Man-Beast uses his cape to physically fly them both to the surface. While ascending back to the surface, we are shown the Man-Beast plan via his inner monologue. Man-Beast desires to lure Warlock into violating his own principles to neutralize the Jewel's power and to shred the fabric of Warlock's soul. Hero and villain emerge from the sewers and rise unseen above the city. For some reason, this reminds me of Virgil and Dante. The tone of the issue changes as the religious overtones come into focus once more. This scene reminds me of the temptation of Christ. As the two men stand there, Man-Beast declares that 
all that can be seen is his dominion. He can give it away or share it with anybody he chooses, and he wants to be partners with Warlock. Anything Warlock wants, Man-Beast is willing to give him. All Warlock has to do is acknowledge that Man-Beast is the master of Counter-Earth. As he says this, Man-Beast tosses his scepter over to Warlock. Man-Beast appears to be attempting to have a real conversation, but Warlock gets freaky on him, using the Soul Gem to bring the Snake Viper on the scepter back to life, and then threatens to use it against Man-Beast before tossing it back as a rejection of Man-Beast's truce. But oddly, he still wants to hear Man-Beast's plan. The Man-Beast shares the story of himself and Counter-Earth, but from a different perspective. The High Evolutionary created Counter-Earth to serve his own ego. The High Evolutionary spent seven score hours building his new world. A score is equal to 20, so seven score comes out to just shy of six days, but that contradicts what we were told earlier when we were told that the High Evolutionary made Counter-Earth in seven hours. From there, the High Evolutionary attempted to make man in his image in an effort to serve his own ego, and failed. He failed because he didn't have the ability to see it through, and collapsed out of exhaustion before his creation was complete. The rest of this is all recap, ending in Warlock meeting his four teen disciples. Man Beast asks Warlock to look within his gaze, and he asks, has Warlock found any good upon this planet? Adam declares that he has, but Man-Beast disputes this. His gaze is having a hypnotic effect on Warlock, who throws up an arm to break the spell. In response, the Soul Gem burst forth, sending a Force Blast out to disrupt Man-Beast onslaught. Man-Beast wants a final word with Warlock. He says that Warlock spoke of friendship and trust. I'm not so sure that Warlock did. Man Beast calls upon Warlock to look upon the counter Earth. Warlock is shown a vision of his four companions running through a city street. A crowd is chasing them for being acquaintances or accomplices of the golden crazy guy who wrecked their block. This is the first we have seen of the teens since they left to seek refuge with the Prophet's sister Estrella. This is the first time we learn her name, and it makes one wonder what role she plays in all this. Remember, the Prophet was the Man-Beast, so who is Estrella? We see Estrella leading the four teens down a blind alley. She then takes off without them. The crowd is closing in and looking for a fight. Jason dives into the action, landing the first punch, and David is quick to follow. A couple of guys grab Ellie, which freaks Eddie out. We don't get to see, but somehow they manage to get Ellie free. Eddie asks that they don't hurt his sister and denies knowing Warlock. The mob goes around to each one of the kids, asking if they know Warlock, and Jason and David both follow Eddie's lead. This reminds me of the biblical story where Peter denies Jesus three times. Each denial makes Warlock angrier and angrier. Warlock feels like his trust has been betrayed. I feel like the kids are being reasonable. They only met Warlock a couple of days ago, he's weird, and he left them alone with a woman who appears to have left them at the hands of an angry mob. Warlock has no right to be mad at their denials, as he's the one who put the kids into their current situation. An angry Warlock considers using force to purify the planet. Man-Beast calls upon Warlock to gaze upon the scene once more. Instead of looking upon Counter-Earth, Warlock's Soul Gem burst forth, and he announces that so far, he's been holding back, and that all of Counter-Earth should beware the Warlock. Man-Beast cowers at the jewel's brilliance. Then the Man-Beast is hit with a blast from the jewel, a blast powerful enough to send the Man-Beast to his doom. Wow, that wrapped up quick. Warlock didn't even take the time to finish hearing Man-Beast out. With 
Man Beast eliminated, Warlock announces that his crusade has just begun. More religious language. As he's closing in, Warlock says that he wants to save Counter-Earth, but he's also still very angry that the teens denied knowing him. So if you wanted to save Counter-Earth, what would your next act be? What could redeem this vile ball of villainy? Right now, Warlock reigns supreme on an Earth without anybody else having superpowers. He's literally Superman in a world with zero competition. So, Angry Warlock levitates to the Counter-Earth's United Nations, which instead of being called the United Nations is called Nations United. Nations bound together to stave off the threat of war, who erected this building as a place to work together to peacefully sort out their differences. Adam Warlock flies in without warning and completely destroys the entire building. He goes on a rampage because a few teens denied knowing him while scared that they were going to get killed by a mob. The next page shows the destruction, shock, and awe of the citizens. Any comic fan has to love the flavor text on this page. It gives us a counter-Earth glimpse into how things might have been if Earth had never had superheroes. We've previously touched on Reed Richards and Victor Von Doom's cordial rivalry. We're told that Tony Stark's heart beats unscathed. And Peter Parker? He died from radioactive overexposure. Wow. The first police on the scene call in reinforcements. Police surround the area and ask Warlock to give himself up. But Warlock has just begun. As he leaps forward, the cops open fire. Warlock's gem rips the bullets apart before they can ever reach him. The cop in charge calls for his men to hold their fire. They're going to have to call in the army. It looks like the Air Force was called in as well. As the jets move in, Warlock levitates into the air. The jets open fire on him. The pilots are shocked when their bullets do nothing to the Golden Man. The command staff assumes the pilot must be having technical problems and calls for him to fall out of formation. But the pilot can't. Warlock has flown beneath the jet and then grabbed it. Suddenly, the pilot begins to see a dazzling light. The plane blows up, but Warlock is fine. In this panel, it states that Warlock is never killed. So what happened with the One Hound of Helios? Or what happened when he knocked down the entire Nations United building in the middle of the day? It, it just seems like somebody should have died from that. The pilot's parachute deploys, and Warlock is watching this guy float to the ground. And as the guy floats, Warlock thinks about his four teenage friends. The soul gem sparkles as Warlock comes in, and instead of helping the man, Warlock chooses to kill him. He dissolves the man's parachute and sends the man screaming to his death. A line has been crossed. If one life can be taken, so can others. What can stand between Adam Warlock and the world? How many lives will he take before his anger is satiated? And then things turn into a modern day disaster movie. Warlock comes in and he destroys the White House while President Nixon takes a morning briefing. He then assassinates the Russian and Chinese heads of states, party chief Brezhnev and chairman Mao. Once the major world government's leaders have been killed, it's implied that the military takes over and that the United States launches a counterattack. They've got a lock on Warlock near Denver. The military is preparing a nuclear strike against Warlock. For the first time since the end of the Counter-Earth Second World War, an atomic weapon has been launched. The High Evolutionary watches as the weapon approaches Adam. As Warlock sits, doing what we don't know, humanity's answer to him rains down from the heavens. Adam turns to face it. The bomb goes off. Thousands of civilians are killed. The four-star general in charge wants to know if Warlock was destroyed in the blast. And then, something appears on their radar. Something survived the blast. And yeah, it's Adam Warlock. And he's looking angry. 
and writer Mike Friedrich does a great job of having Adam put everything into perspective. The world's greatest weapon has failed. Major governments are leaderless and their cities are destroyed. Warlock is ready to rule this world. All he has to do now is wait for them to come groveling to him. And wow, Adam Warlock has become the superest of super villains. It's in that moment he spies something in the wreckage below. The teens, as Warlock lands beside the kid to stoked his rage. David remarks that Warlock has become evil. Warlock asks if they dare to face him. The kids step forward. Yeah, they, they dare because they remember when Warlock was good. Jason calls on Warlock to stop. Warlock calls the teens out for their previous transgression. It was they who betrayed him first. Such worthless beings should be annihilated. Wow, note to self, never break a promise to Adam Warlock. David shoots it straight with Warlock. Hey, we were just scared kids, not superheroes. We're just people. Warlock's hands in this panel are super creepy. He's struggling to make up his mind, kill the kids or let them go. Warlock says that he's touched their souls and he knows that they are good because it felt good to touch them. So creepy, don't go around touching kids' souls. Warlock concludes that the kids may be weak, but they aren't evil. And then, out of nowhere, the four kids begin merging together until they form into... The Man Beast. Oh man, is, is everybody the Man Beast? He's so good at disguises. Warlock accuses the Man Beast of all of this being a hypnotic dream. Man Beast explains that what they are playing with instead are branches in the timeline. But if Warlock had decided to kill the kids, well, all that would have been real. In killing the kids, Man Beast's essence would have been transferred to Warlock, who would eventually become as evil as Man Beast. All of this was a ploy to make Warlock kill the kids, and once Man Beast had finished corrupting Warlock, that would have been enough for the High Evolutionary to give up on Counter Earth and destroy it. And just to be clear, everything that took place from the moment after Man Beast asked Warlock to look into his eyes took place on an alternate timeline, but because Warlock didn't kill the kids, that timeline never took place. It was just one of many possibilities. Does this mean that Warlock still hasn't killed anybody, or did he kill somebody, but he did it in a different timeline? Again, no time for answers. Man Beast dives in to attack Adam Warlock, angry that he might have lost a chance at a victory which would forever fester the High Evolutionary's immortal soul. As Man Beast dives at Warlock's throat, he notes that Warlock appears weak. The two have at it with each other. Here it is Man Beast versus Warlock, the showdown. Warlock grabs the Man Beast and then uses his super secret trick. We get a great callback as Warlock starts devolving Man Beast back into a wolf. And Man Beast knows what is happening. He can feel it and calls out, he needs to live. Man Beast fight or flight response kicks in, and for the sake of survivability, he chooses flight. Instead of letting his prey get away, Warlock attempts to follow a lingering green mist. It leads Warlock to the city below, into the crowd where all traces of Man Beast disappear. Warlock, looking for one missing person, out of nowhere discovers four. David, Jason, Eddie, and Ellie, all four are happy to see Adam. They got afraid that the Prophet had converted him. Warlock reaches out and touches them, and in touching them knows that these are his real friends and not something spun together by the man-beast. Maybe he even touches their souls a little bit? The five of them turn, striding into the future together. Thus ends the Roy Thomas era of Adam Warlock. And what a wild ride that was. Stan Lee and Jack Kirby gave us him. 
and Roy Thomas has crafted that into an entire religious mythos, with Warlock being a Christ-like figure for another Earth that is very much like our own Earth. Later writers will expound upon these religious ideas and take things much further. What's a Christ figure without a crucifixion, right? Issues 4 through 8 of Warlock Volume 1 will cover the Mike Friedrich era with the character before we move on to the big one, Jim Starlin's run. Overall, I think the religious overtones were a little bit over the top, but I enjoyed Roy's time spent with the character. He took the character him and molded that character into Adam Warlock. He introduces the Soul Gem, and he sets Warlock down the path of Savior, Redeemer, and Judge. All roles Warlock will continue to play over the coming years and decades. My only problem with this ending is that it doesn't give us much more than we started with. Warlock sets out with the same companions he started with. Man Beast still exists, but he's reverted back into an unknown. Nor is there any conversation with the High Evolutionary to help wrap this story up. All the same, the story will continue. Across these four issues, Gil Kane's pencils are a good reflection of the art during this era. Comparing the two inkers side by side, that would be Dan Atkins' inks in the first two issues of Marvel Premiere and Tom Sutton's work in the first two issues of Warlock, I definitely have to say I prefer Dan Atkins' work. Artist and writer Mark Friedrich will now pick up the reins and carry us through Warlock's next arc. But first, we'll need to take a look at issue number 158 of The Incredible Hulk. Thanks for watching Cosmic Comics. Feel free to hit any of the buttons below. I am out.